Chapter 19 Winston trudged through the tall grass, trailing the other two men who led the way. The two men ahead of him, Leof Wine and Boya, carried axes. Winston dragged a wooden sledge behind him. They walked away from the village through the chill morning mist, heading toward the woods that started a half-mile from their house. It was winter, and the need for firewood was constant. Leof Wine and Boya were discussing crops, pointing out the fields, now dormant, and what should be planted in the spring, and how. They discussed which ox might do the plowing, and how to ask permission for its use, for they had no ox of their own. The conversation drifted to how to tell which frost was the last one of the year, and how soon afterward to plow. The men were farmers deep in their bones, and such discussions could go on endlessly. Winston, however, was having trouble even imagining the spring. "'Keep up, Winston!' called Leofwine jovially. He wasn't upset. He just wanted to include Winston, or let him know that he wasn't forgotten. But Winston was brooding, and didn't want to talk. He thought of the four people who remained at the house that morning. His wife, Madwin, Boya's wife, Yadlu, and their daughter, Duna, and the boy, Sprott. Even now, he hated the feeling of leaving them. Any time they were out of sight, they could be in danger. Not that he could do anything to protect them anyway. He had learned that when the Northmen had attacked. They had burned the church killed the abbess, and dragged off ten women and children from the village, including his only daughter. Even now, a year and a half later, Winston remembered parts of that day perfectly, and couldn't forget them even when he tried. Other parts were a blur, or simply missing, like what he ate for dinner the night after the raid, or the last thing his daughter had said to him. Gone. But he could remember the Northmen leading her to the boats with the others, and he couldn't stop seeing it. Leofwine's sister had been taken, too, and her husband killed when he tried to resist. Their son, Sprott, had been spared, so now Sprott lived with Leofwine and the rest of them. He was nine now, and though he used to ask about his father and mother constantly, he didn't any more. Winston wondered whether Sprott had finally accepted what had happened, or was starting to forget. The three men reached the woods and began inspecting trees. Winston's shoes were nothing more than thick leather laced at the top. They weren't waterproof and had no sole or tread. They were soaking from the damp ground, and his toes were already numb. It would be a long morning, but they needed the wood. Besides, what would be the use of sitting around at home? There was nothing to do back there but sit and think, and that was no good for anyone. Leofwine and Boya selected a tree and stood on opposite sides. They planted their feet wide and began chopping, alternating swings of their axes. Leofwine was tall and powerfully built. He had long dark hair and thick eyebrows. Boya was shorter and stocky. He was strong from years of work, but round-faced and red-cheeked. Now, in the morning mist, the men were quiet, and they focused on the rhythmic chopping. Winston, with nothing to do for the moment, sat on the sledge to keep himself off the cold earth, and thought back to his last months at Heritu. After the Northmen had left, the monks and nuns of Heritu didn't stay long. Winston didn't know how or when they decided to leave, they had simply announced about a month after the attack that the abbey was being disbanded. Some of the holy brothers and sisters would go north to Wearmouth and Jarrow, some south to Yeoverwich, and some down the coast to Strayonshaw. They loaded up what remaining treasures they had, books mostly. Many villagers went with them, but Winston and Madwin stayed. Madwin had wanted to go with the monks at first, but Winston had argued that here in the village they had a house and a garden, wheat fields and ducks. He had his potter's wheel and a good source of clay. Why should they leave that? They couldn't take their house and garden with them to Jero. There was another reason, of course. He had last seen Yadith on the beach near his own house. He knew she was gone forever. But if she weren't, if she weren't, that would be where she would return. But it was a useless wish, he knew. The remaining villagers found that they needed the monastery more than they had thought. The part-time craftsmen, the smith, the brewer, and Winston the potter, had sold much of what they made to the monastery, and the remaining villagers were unwilling to spend anything on luxuries anymore. The village cooperation that had seemed second nature before wasn't so easy now. 
There were fewer people to trade with and borrow from, so it was harder to get what was needed. There was no more milk, because the milk cows had gone along to a new home. There was no one who could make good shoes, so Madwin had to do the best she could with shoddy tools. No one came to the village to trade, either. The yearly fair that used to be held in front of the abbey gates simply never happened, as if everyone from the Humber to the Tyne knew that there was nothing left in Heritu, and avoided it. The fair was more than a fun celebration for Winston. It was where he sold a lot of his goods. When people from outlying areas who didn't live near craftsmen came to do their yearly buying, without the abbey, the fair disappeared. They persisted through the fall and winter, but the winter was harsh, and everyone went hungry. That spring, the last few villagers decided to leave. Winston and Madwin had eaten every vegetable stored for the winter, and all of the ducks that they kept, so they joined the other families as they loaded an ox cart with what they could. Winston took his potter's wheel. When one of his fellow travelers objected, saying it weighed too much, Winston, normally not one to speak harshly, pointed out that some people were letting their children ride in the cart. As his own child had been taken from him, the least he was entitled to was to bring along the tool he needed for his livelihood. The trip to Stranachal was not difficult, but they arrived without a plan. Most of the villagers had lived their whole lives near the abbey at Heritu, and figured that they could simply find another abbey and begin anew. They were mostly correct. The abbess at Stranachal offered them tenancy on some vacant land. It had never been cultivated, so they had to break the ground themselves. Stranachal Abbey sat on the banks of the river Esk, which flowed north to the sea. The village was mostly to the south of the abbey, and the land they were offered was past the southern edge. The new arrivals had to clear the land of stones and bushes and build houses and fences. In return, the abbess would forgive their rent for a year. It was not a bad deal, but they had to move quickly to get crops in the ground in time, and they had nothing stored up until their garden started producing. The prior, who spoke for the abbess on business matters, consented to give them a few sacks of grain and a large cheese. Winston had asked about selling pottery to the abbey, but the prior assured him that there was already a potter in the village, and their needs were well provided for. Winston even went to the village potter, a short, balding man with a wife and two sons. The man was happy to meet another craftsman, and Winston admired his work. They both made the same style of wheel-thrown pots, and Winston told the man about how he had learned from his father in Conchester. But as soon as Winston started asking about where to acquire good clay, the man clammed up. He gave vague answers about how there was no good clay locally, and he had to have it brought in, but he would not say how or from where. Eventually, Winston asked to join Boa and Leofwain on the new farm they were planning, and they accepted him gladly. If they all pooled their resources and shared the work they figured, they would have a better chance of making it. The three families hastily put up a house of woven willow sticks plastered with mud and thatched with reeds, and began clearing land and digging a garden. Winston traded his potter's wheel to the local potter in exchange for a young pig. They were able to get some seeds in the ground early enough that there was a decent harvest that year, and neighbors sometimes gave bread, milk, or vegetables to keep them going. Now the harvest was past, and the little collective was rationing out what they had saved. Winston jumped when he heard the crack of the falling tree and stood out of the way as it landed with a crack. He offered to take the axe from Boya and he and Leofwine limbed the tree while Boya collected branches and piled them on the sledge. It took one trip to get the branches back to the house, and another to bring the trunk. Sprott ran up to them as they approached, and helped pull the sledge the rest of the way. He was eager to please and full of energy. For a long time after losing his parents he had been quiet and reserved, and Leofwine had looked after him patiently, helping him through his grief. The move to Strayanshaw had seemed to be good for him, and this past summer he had befriended other children in the village. Now he chatted to his uncle about how he had fed the chickens and swept out their coop and fetched water from the river. Winston found his wife by the fire kneading dough. He touched her shoulder gently. She smiled at him, but there was a sadness in her eyes. She had not been much happier than he recently. She was pregnant, and though that would normally be cause for celebration, it only cost her worry. The other two women, Yadlu and her daughter Duna, were chatting as they prepared a barley soup with onions. Duna had been given the onion by a man in the village, who had given her gifts before. She and her mother agreed that this was significant, but disagreed on what to do next. Duna wanted to give him something in return, while Yadlu tried to convince her to stay home the next day to see if the man would come looking for her. Their conversation continued throughout the meal, 
including an analysis of whether the onion itself was significant, and if so, what the message was. Madwin, however, ate in silence. The three men and Sprott went back for another tree that afternoon. To make their winter stores stretch further, they had started chopping extra firewood to trade to others in the village. Though some of the villagers in Stranachal grumbled about the new arrivals, most were charitable and helped when they could. That evening Winston lay on his straw mattress, wrapped in a wool blanket, as the fire died down. Leofwine and Boyo were telling riddles to Sprott. Madwin came to him and lay down beside him. "'What are you thinking about?' she asked. "'What to do about this place?' he said. "'We need a real hearth, not just rocks. "'And we should level the floor and pack it down. "'But maybe, with a baby on the way, we should build our own house. "'I'm sure the others would help us.' "'He looked at her and saw her same expression of sadness. "'She had, during her life, lost two pregnancies before the sixth month, "'and lost two infants within a week of their birth. "'Yadith had been the only child who had survived, but now she was gone.' Madwin's eyes told Winston that she had the same worries he did, that no matter how they tried, they might never see a child grown. Winston kissed his wife on the forehead. Don't worry, he said. All is as God wills it, and nothing more. A pause in the fireside conversation let Winston notice something in the distance. It sounded like a crowd of people, but far off. It was almost twilight. Why would there be a crowd moving toward this end of the village? He wondered if a cow had gotten loose. Do you hear that? he asked Leofwine and Boya, but they clearly had. They stood and listened, then everyone got up and went outside to see what was happening. When Winston saw the crowd approaching, the first thing he noticed was excitement, not alarm. Clearly something big was happening, but what? He saw other villagers he knew walking toward the house and pointing, then suddenly he realized who was at the front of the crowd of people, and his knees buckled. Yadith! he shouted, just as Madwin saw for herself and ran forward to greet their daughter. Winston tried to stand, but tripped over his own feet. By the time he caught up to his wife, she was already holding Yadith to her and crying for joy. He put his arms around both of them and found he was crying too. After a moment, Yadith broke away. She looked around the crowd, which was now milling around outside of the house and talking excitedly. Some of them were saying that they knew Yadith from back at Heritu, and some were recounting how the two girls had sailed their boat right up onto the beach below the abbey, and how the younger one had hopped out and announced that she was looking for her parents. Yadith spotted Gunhild, who was standing silently, almost in shock. Yadith took her by the hand and pulled her to her parents. "'Mother, father, this is Gunhild,' said Yadith. "'She saved my life and brought me here. Can she stay with us?' "'Of course,' said Winston, sniffing back tears. "'Gunhild, thank you so much.' Gunhild remained silent, overwhelmed at all that was going on around her. "'Are you hungry?' asked Madwin. "'Will you come have some food?' Madwin took Gunhild's hand in hers, but Gunhild looked more scared than before. "'She doesn't speak English,' said Yadith. "'She's Danish. But yes, we would love some food.'" That evening Gunhild watched the joyful reunion from afar. Yadith sat with the rest of the household around the fire, talking excitedly. Gunhild lay upon a pile of straw that had been brought in for extra bedding. As the others chatted, she surveyed the inside of the little house. The mud-caked walls had been hastily put up, she could tell, and they were crumbling in some places. There were few personal effects. Some trunks, she could see, which people now sat on, and some baskets and pots. The bare ground was cold and hard. Mattresses, simple bags of straw, lined the edges, and the hearth around which the household gathered was made of unmortared stones. She could get a sense of what people were saying from their faces and voice, but the words were like a jumble. She realized with a sinking feeling that every day was going to be like this. She was a stranger and couldn't communicate with anyone but Yada. From time to time someone would try to talk to her, but she couldn't respond, and they soon gave up. They handed her food and made sure she was comfortable, but then ignored her. Eventually the fire died down and Yada joined her in the straw pile. They shared a blanket. We're home, Yadith whispered to her happily, but Gunhild said nothing. When Gunhild awoke the next morning, she surveyed the cramped hut and the people in it. Was this her home now? Was she expected to keep traveling? Her thoughts turned to her own home, 
if indeed that was her home any more. She wondered what Ragnolf had been doing with the farm since she had left. What were Wolf and Brunyard doing now? Yadith started the fire, and the men of the household got up and readied the sledge and axes and went to the forest. Sprott let out the chickens to scratch for bugs. The women gathered around the fire and started on daily tasks. Yadlu and Duna patched clothes and mended shoes, while Yadith and her mother ground grain and made dough. Gunhild sat and listened to the conversation, picking out a word here and there. Every once in a while someone would look over at her, as if they were talking about her. Eventually Yadith came and sat down next to her in the straw and spoke in Danish. She chatted happily and pointed out to Gunhild who was who and what was going on. Yadlu says Duna has an admirer in the village, said Yadith. His name is Alfred. That means Elf Council. It's weird when you think of it. You know, my mother's name isn't English. She's called Madwin. Her parents' parents were Welsh. They were captured in battle, and her parents gave her a Welsh name. Don't any of them spin or weave? asked Gunhild. Actually, the village is a bit short on wool, said Yadith. They were just talking about it. All the extra people in the village means there's less wool to go around. When the mist burns off, we're going to work in the garden a bit. We have kale and onions and turnips, but Yadlu says that the first frost is coming soon, so we should pull them all. And after dinner, Duna is going out today to trade some firewood for food. You should come with us. After the men returned with their wood and everyone had had their midday meal, Yadith and Gunhild accompanied Duna through the village. The day was misty and grey, and Gunhild kept her blanket around her as they walked from their farm toward the monastery, stopping at farms along the way to chat. Some of the houses looked better built, larger with walls of wooden slats. There were gardens, animal pens, haystacks, and woodpiles. As they got nearer the monastery, the houses got closer together, and Gunhild noticed signs that craftsmen lived there. A forge, some sawhorses, some skins stretched tight on a frame. Duna and Yadith talked with everyone they met, and people were curious to find out more about their story, but when they tried talking to Gunhild, she simply shook her head. Yadith tried switching back and forth from English to Danish to keep Gunhild caught up on what was being said, but that proved too difficult. At one point, at the house of a farmer, a young man came out and greeted Duna, and they went to walk together for a bit, leaving Yadith and Gunhild alone together. Yadith, what am I supposed to do now? asked Gunhild. Now? Uh, wait for Duna to get back, and then keep asking people whether they need firewood. No, I mean now that I'm here, Gunhild explained. Am I supposed to stay at your house? Am I supposed to help with chores? Do I just sit in a straw pile and wait for food? Yadith looked concerned at the hint of panic in Gunhild's voice. She put her hands on her friend's shoulders. It's your house too now. We'll figure things out. But why not learn some English? Look, Hus, Wayne, Hannah. She pointed at things as she named them. Wait, wait, said Gunhild. It's just too much. Just too much at once. I'm sorry, said Yadith. The weather grew colder. Weeks went by, and Gunhild's daily routine started to feel normal, if not comfortable. She and Yadith found things to do on the farm together. The men had been working to clear a meadow of stones and trees so it could be plowed in the spring. Gunhild, Yadith, and Sprott were given the job of chopping brush and prying up stumps. They used a hatchet and a wood shovel, and even broke the shovel once while they were leaning on it all together trying to dislodge a bush. The ground wasn't the light, crumbly soil needed for plowing. It was full of roots and stones. Once cleared, the whole field would need to be worked with a shovel and a hoe, foot by foot. They were also allowed to chop wood, and Gunhild found that she enjoyed the repetitive exertion. Just as back home, during the short days and the cold weather, a lot of time was spent around the fire, telling jokes and stories and singing songs. Gunhild listened but couldn't join in. Sometimes she caught people looking at her, and then especially she felt like she was some foreign oddity in this household. She watched Yadith and her parents with longing. For the first few days after they had arrived, Yadith rarely left her mother's side, except maybe to sit with her father sometimes. Yadith and her mother would talk for hours. Sometimes they would take turns singing or comb and braid each other's hair. When they invited Gunhild to join them, she always felt she was intruding. At the same time, she missed her own family intensely. Every Sunday the villagers went to the church at the monastery for mass, and Gunhild went with them. The first time she went, Yadith talked her through it. It's just like the mass Father Wilfrith said in Frisia, remember? Yadith told her. It's all in Latin. Just listen and follow along. 
They walked inside the wooden fence that surrounded the abbey, and Gunhild saw a complex of wooden buildings scattered about the grounds. Some were small, and Yadith explained that individual monks or nuns lived in them, monks to the south and nuns to the north. She didn't know what each of the bigger buildings were, but said that they must be the kitchen, the hall, and the scriptorium. In the middle of the grounds stood the stone church, and Gunhild followed the crowd inside. It was a plain church, with thick walls and small windows, but there was a gold chalice with jewels on it that sat on the altar, and the priest who officiated had a gold crucifix. Gunhild remembered what her father had said. The real treasure is in the churches. The monks sang, which surprised Gunhild, and when they sang together inside the stone walls it had a stunning effect, quite different from Father Wilfrith's timid singing that she remembered. She understood none of what was going on during Mass, though. When the villagers knelt, she knelt too, and she rose when they rose. No one explained anything about it afterward. What is the point of a ceremony that no one understands, she thought. At least her gods back home spoke the same language she did. An hour later, it was over. Gunhild wasn't sure whether this meant she was Christian now or not. She thought about asking Yadith, but decided she didn't want an answer. Day by day, she listened to the conversation around her, and she started to pick up new words. Some seemed quite familiar. Bread, which she knew as brod, was breyad. Her own word for stone was stein, but now it was stan. But the sentences were different and strange. None of the grammar made sense. As a result, she could often know what a conversation was about without understanding much of what was being said. When she tried to make an English sentence of her own, she was stuck. She had words, but couldn't put them together. She often followed after Yadith as they explored the farms and the village or the surrounding fields and woods. They visited neighbors their own age, who were all curious about Yadith and Gunhild and the adventures that they had had. Once they went to the river to fetch water and found two boys and a girl. The boys looked about fourteen or fifteen, Gunhild's age. The girl was younger, maybe nine. They seemed happy to see the new members of the village. Hello, called one of the boys. I heard about you. You're the girls with the boat. That's us, said Yadith. I'm Wolfmar, said the boy. This is Waddle and his sister Mildreth. Hello, then, said Yadith, filling up her bucket. Isn't your name Yadith? asked Wolfmar. It might be, she said, smiling. Or it might be Bjarnhild. I've been known to fight bears, you know. The younger girl, Mildreth, approached Gunhild. Is that your boat on the beach below the abbey? she asked. Did you really cross the sea? Gunhild shook her head slowly, unsure what to say. Do you speak English? asked Mildreth. She speaks a little, said Yadith, jumping in. Wolfmar approached Gunhild with a sly smile. I could teach you, he said. Here, let me show you. He reached out to take her hand, but Gunhild snatched it back. Leave off, said Yadith, slapping at Wolfmar's shoulder. What word are you going to teach her, then? Cheeky? Wolfmar laughed. How about handsome? he asked. Here, who do you think is better looking, Waddle or me? He put his arm around Waddle and struck a pose. You should start with the word arrogant, smirked Yadith, and she and Gunhild walked back toward their farm. Come back tomorrow, called Wolfmar after them. Maybe, said Yadith over her shoulder. As they walked away, Gunhild whispered to Yadith, Wait, was he flirting with us? He was doing his best, I'm sure, said Yadith. People here are so strange, said Gunhild. What, people don't flirt in Denmark? said Yadith. There was a hint of annoyance in her voice. Everyone here is trying to be friendly to you, you know. You haven't tried to be friendly to anyone. But I can't understand anyone, shouted Gunhild. How am I supposed to do anything if I can't understand? You could start by smiling, said Yadith. What should I smile about, said Gunhild, getting carried away. I live in a cramped hut with a bunch of strangers. We're either working or sitting around bored. I wasn't allowed to sit around when I lived at your house, muttered Yadith. Gunhild stopped short, realizing what Yadith meant. She was right, of course. Gunhild's life here was nothing like what Yadith had gone through. At the same time, she resented Yadith for bringing it up, as if Yadith's suffering had been Gunhild's fault. 
Angry at herself for being ungrateful, and angry at Yadith for making her feel guilty, she stomped off and didn't come back to the house until dinner.